Welcome. Welcome to the October 9th meeting of the Berkeley School Board. If you want to follow along on our online agenda, the agenda is posted on the district website. I'm now calling this meeting to order at 7 11 p.m. I have broken my foot, so I will chair the meeting from this side of the room today. And with that, Ms. Chires, can you please call the official roll for tonight's meeting? Yes, uh, Director Jennifer Shinoski. Here. Director Laura Babbitt. Director Winta Clark. Here. Director Mike Chang. Here. Vice President Khadija Brown. Present. President Ana Vasudev. Presente. Thank you, Ms. Chires. We will now approve the agenda for this evening's meeting. Colleagues, is there a motion and a second to approve the agenda? I move that we approve at this evening's agenda. It was moved by Vice President Brown. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Director Shinoski. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Um, colleagues, today we dedicate this meeting to Dale Long, a longtime preschool teacher with BUSD and union leader who passed away this week. After retiring in 2020, Dale continued to work with, B with BUSD preschools as a substitute teacher. Dale was a living embodiment of true union values. He believed in community, kindness, solidarity, and working together, said Kathy Campbell, the past president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. He believed there was nothing we could not do if we worked together. He was deeply committed to early childhood education and raised the awareness of the entire BUSD community to our amazing preschools and preschool educators. Dale served many roles in the Berkeley Federation of Teachers as a member of many negotiations teams, longtime treasurer and secretary. He has always been a champion of preschool educators. So I just wanna take a moment of silence to remember Dale and to thank all of our um, educators and particularly the preschool educators who wrote to us in his memory. Thank you. With that, I'm excited to announce that we're gonna kick off this meeting with a student showcase in honor of Latino Heritage Month. September 15th to October 15th marks Latinx Heritage Month, where we celebrate the impact and accomplishments of the Latin, that the Latinx community has had on the United States for generations. I'm excited to introduce a children's musical group organized by Abel Salas, a BUSD parent leader from Latinos Unidos of Berkeley. He organized a space at Sylvia Mendez for a teacher, Ms. Herrera, from La Peña Cultural Center. To <laughs> To, okay, yeah, to expose children to folkloric music of Latin, of Latin America and teach them how to play guitar. Six students from BUSD and no USD make up this group that meets once a week on Mondays and is open to, Evans, to any seven to 12 year old in BUSD. Today, Adela Orozco in fifth grade, Maita Salas in fourth grade, Siva Salinas in fifth grade, Leilani Mendoza in third grade, and Valentina Percy in fifth grade will be performing in celebration of Latino Heritage Month. And Isabel from fifth grade too. <laughs> and now I'm going to say the same thing in Spanish. Estoy emocionada de comenzar esta reunión con una exhibición estudiantil en honor al mes de la herencia latina. Del, del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre se celebra el mes de la herencia latina, donde celebramos el impacto y los logros que la comunidad latina ha tenido en los Estados Unidos durante generaciones. Estoy emocionada de presentarles un grupo musical infantil organizado por Abel Salas, un padre líder, líder del distrito y de Latinos Unidos de Berkeley. Organizó un espacio en Silvia Méndez para que la maestra, la señora Herrera, del Centro Cultural La Peña, le enseñara a los niños la música folclórica de América Latina y les enseñara a tocar la guitarra. Seis estudiantes del distrito y del distrito de Oakland forman parte de este grupo, que se reúne una vez a la semana, los lunes, y está abierto a cualquier niño de las edades 7 a 12. Hoy, Adela Orozco, Maíta Salas, Silvia Salinas, Leilani Mendoza, Valentina Percy y también Isabel. Isabel, de quinto grado, hará una presentación para celebrar el mes de la herencia latina. Muchísimas gracias y bienvenido a nuestros estudiantes.
Buenas noches. Uh, good evening. My name is Juan Francisco Orozco. I have the privilege to be Adela's dad. Uh, so I've been asked by the parents, by the parents to just say a, a couple of words of gratitude. Uh, the first thing we want to say is this one. All right. All right. I'm going to speak it up. Can you hear me now? All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is I want to thank uh, the folks at Sylvia Mendez, especially Alejandra Frias, and just the community. They really opened up that space for a, um, a weekly uh, practice for, for the girls. And so it's been just a wonderful experience. So thank you very much. These are, these are uh, six of our, uh, of our uh, students. This, we've been, some of these girls have been practicing for two years. They represent about a dozen or so families that have come through and practiced with us. So um, so thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation by the board for us to present a little bit. Uh, you know, and just more than anything, I want to also thank the parents of just the logistics, right? Mucha logística para llevar a las niñas a práctica, right? Uh, but more than anything, also, I want to I wanna just thank the girls for being brave and being up here for you guys. So... So with uh, having said all that, uh, I want to hand it over to Lailani, and so she can kick it off. You're going to hear two songs, okay? All right, ready? <clears throat> Our first song is Ay Jalisco No Te Rajes. Our next song is Mexico Lindo y Querido. Un, dos, tres, un, dos, tres. Bye. 
Este fue el grupo Guitarra Latinoamericana. Gracias. Were you guys nervous? Yeah. You were? Yeah. You can tell the way you Thank you very much, and thank you to our amazing students. And now we will report out from our closed session. Vice President Brown, please report out on closed session.
Let's give it up one more time for our amazing young people. You can do a little better than that. Give them some love. Good evening, everyone. It is so great to see a packed house, to house tonight. Uh, we haven't seen this in a long time, so it feels like we're going back to the old days, but I'm so happy to see all of you all here. Our report from this evening's closed session is as follows. This evening closed session was called to order at 5.36 p.m. For item 3.1.1, the board heard an update and provided direction. For item 3.1.2, it was moved by Director Shinoski, seconded by President Vasudev, and all board directors voted in favor. For item 3.1.3, .3, it was moved by Director Shinoski, seconded by Director Babbitt, and all directors voted in favor, with the exception of President ba Basudev, who recused herself from this item. For item 3.2, uh, Director Shinoski voted to table this item, and it was seconded by myself, Vice President ba Brown, and all board directors voted in favor. For item 3.3.1, it was moved by Director Chang and seconded by Vice President Brown. And for item 3.4, the board will uh, go back to closed session after this evening's meeting to discuss that item, and the report out for that item will happen at the next board meeting on October 30th. This ends the reading of the notes from closed session, and I'll turn it back over to you, President Bob. Thank you so much, Vice President Brown. And now we'll turn it over to our Superintendent Anika ford Morthel for her comments. Good afternoon, BUSD family. Good afternoon, BUSD family. One more time, I just need to appreciate the babies of Sylvia Mendez for coming to share with us their gifts of song and to uh, recognize uh, Latinx Heritage Month, which we celebrate here in BUSD uh, with the rest of the world between, well, not the rest of the world, with others between September 15th and October 15th. Um, for me, seeing our babies perform is the highlight of the evening. Luckily for me and the other educators in this room, we get to see our babies brilliant and amazing in their talents and share with the, share their gifts every day. So again, thank you to the Sylvia Mendez students for coming to share. I also wanna let you all know that October is not only Latinx Heritage Month, but it is also LGBTQ plus and Filipino XO historic history months as well. Um, we celebrate and honor the diversity of our students every single day. And this October, again, we not only lift up our Latinx uh, students and families and their rich culture and contributions to our BUSD community as well as our world, but we also lift up and celebrate, again, our LGBTQ plus and our Filipino, Filipina, Philippon X families and students as well. We do encourage you to visit our LGBTQ plus history month webpage to view our staff posters, find our reading list by grade level, and learn about the many variations of the pride flag. On our AAPI Heritage Month webpage, you will find family guides, teaching guides, and reading lists for celebrations of um, this important month and much, much more. We committed this year to refocusing ourselves to hashtag teaching and learning, um, and we are excited to do so. We're also excited to announce that in the spirit of teaching and learning, we have an elementary school here in BUSD that has just been named the 2024 National Blue Ribbon School, and that school is none other than John Muir Elementary. Now we know there's amazing teaching and learning that goes on in all of our schools, um, but I wanna share with you that John Muir is actually the only school in Berkeley to ever receive this distinction. The school was nominated based on its overall academic performance, including a whopping 38% increase in fifth grade reading performance from, 21, from 2021 to 2024, and a 16% increase in fifth grade math performance during that same period. John Muir also saw an increase in all subgroups that are meeting proficiency in reading and math. And we still have a lot of work to do to close our gap. We know a lot of great work is happening across our sites. We wanted to recognize and celebrate John Muir for this amazing accomplishment.
Again, when we talk about our students and our diverse student body, we think about all of their diversities, even the ways in which they learn. Um, and so we want to make sure that folks know that we have a webinar that we're hosting on next week, October 17th, for our students who have IEPs, for the families of students who have IEPs. An opportunity for you to learn more about our special education programming here in BUSD, to meet our special education uh, staff at the central office, as well as many of our educators at the site level as well. We will share the department's mission. We will make sure you know your rights as parents and give you tools to navigate and understand the IEP process as well as the work that we're doing to improve our services within special education. Again, that is on next week, October 17th. It's a webinar from six to seven. More information can be found on our website. Finally, I see y'all here. <laughs> Monday, just this Monday, we gathered together to recommit to our mission statement. I'm not gonna make you recite it, but our mission statement is to enable and inspire our diverse student body to achieve academic excellence and make positive contributions to the world. I joined our teachers and educators first in the morning, our certificated staff, and I told you that I understand that before we could ask you to enable and inspire our students, that we need to make sure that you are enabled, that you are in the conditions to do this amazing work, and that you are also inspired. Go ahead and shake the poster. But then after, after I left, after I left y'all, I went to the classified staff and I let the classified staff know that they too are responsible for enabling and inspiring our diverse student body. And I let them know that even though I said that the teachers are amazing and that everything we do is in service of what happens in the classroom, I told them there ain't no class without classified. I reminded them I reminded them that they are the nuts and the bolts of our organization. And so I just wanted you all to know, I saw you on Monday and I see you now. I see the things that you do in service of our students, in service of our families, in service of each other. And I understand that we cannot realize our mission without each and every one of you. I look forward to coming back to the table to engage you, our various labor partners, to make sure that, again, you have those conditions that we do our part to make sure that you are enabled to do the amazing, amazing, magical things that you do with our babies every day and in the days to come. Thank you, President. That's my last statement. Thank you, Superintendent. We will now move to the public comments component of our agenda. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you of our decorum expectations during this and all parts of tonight's meeting. No person shall disturb the order of this meeting. Such behavior includes, but is not limited to booing, hissing, creating or participating in a physical disturbance, speaking out of, term in out of turn in violation of applicable rules, preventing or attempting to prevent others who have the floor from speaking, preventing others from observing the meeting, entering into or remaining in the area of the meeting room that's not open to the public, or approaching the dais without permission. As Ms. Chires has already explained, there are two opportunities for public comments at each meeting, now and at the end of the meeting. If you do not get to speak at the beginning of the meeting, we encourage you to stay and speak at the end of the meeting. You may also email us your comments at boardofed at berkeley.net. The board does not respond directly to comments or questions made during public comment. Board members, the superintendent, and staff do take notes during public comment and may follow up with the speaker after the meeting. These are hybrid meetings, so we have public commenters in the boardroom and online. We have designated 20 minutes of comments to our, to our in-person speakers, followed by 10 minutes of comments from online speakers. Anyone wishing to make public comments should raise their virtual hand now so Ms. Chavez can organize. If you're a student online, please indicate that you're a student so we can call on you first. And each public commenter tonight, we have a lot of public comment, will have one minute to speak. Um, Please note that the microphone will shut, up, shut off at the end of each speaker's allotted time, so time your comments accordingly, and I will call your name in order of speakers on the agenda. To keep things moving, I'd like to ask that the speaker who's next in line come forward and wait near the mic. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name. Please restate your name if I mispronounce it so we can get it correctly um, the next time. And we'll now begin our public comments with those who are in person. Per tradition, we're going to start with our student commenters, and I'll have our student director, Winter Clark, uh, call up our student commenters first. So if you can call up the in-person comments, that'd be great. I would first like to bring up Andrew Reagan to the podium. You have one minute.
Is this on? Oh, perfect. Um, I had to kill a paragraph. I didn't know I was going to have a minute. All right. Good evening. My name is Andrew Regan. I'm a Berkeley High senior and the proud older brother of a neurodiverse student. I wanted to come tonight to thank you for establishing DSAC, the new superintendent's Disability, Equity, and Special Education Advisory Committee. This important new committee follows from your December 2023 resolution declaring January Disability Awareness and History Month. We offer a special thank you to Board President Anna Vasudev for helping drive the creation of this new committee. As a student, I can tell you firsthand that frequently this community is siloed, held separate from the rest of us in BUSD. This is unfortunate as it benefits all of us to build our own awareness, make space for, and listen to students and families who experience BUSD differently. Disabilities are often a forgotten difference that we need to recognize, welcome, and fully include in our community. The new DSAC committee will have a first information session on Thursday, October 17th at 6 p.m. via Google, Google Meet. We look forward to the announcement and invitation from the district, which will be sent to the entire BUSD community, and we welcome everyone to join and learn more. Again, thank you to Superintendent Fort Marthel, Assistant. To... Ah. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Next, I'm going to call um, uh, first commenters, uh, Viri Castro-Silva, Cynthia Dickerson, and Asia Long. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. So Viri, Cynthia, and Asia could approach the dice. That'd be great. All right, hello everybody. My name is Viridiana Castro Silva, she, they pronouns. I am a third year elementary school teacher at Rosa Parks. I also serve as our chair of school side council, PTA teacher liaison, um, teacher tech leader, and I've also served as part of our leadership committee and our safety committee. Um, and I'm also part of our anti-racist work at Rosa Parks. Um, I love being part of this community. I love serving this community. Um, and this is the district I want to spend the rest of my career in. I am here to ask the board to treat my colleagues and myself with dignity and increase the compensation offer. I'm also unable to live in the community that I serve, which really hurts my heart. Um, I want to be here, um, but it's just cheaper to simply commute elsewhere and come into this district. I am still here as of now, but many teachers who have taught similar years as I have, have left this district or the profession entirely. We cannot get by. As a fifth grade teacher, I want my students to come by and say, hey, teacher V, miss you, love you, um, which they do now, but I still miss that. Thank you. Next, next we have Cynthia Dickerson, followed by Asia Long. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Dickerson, and I've been teaching preschool in Berkeley Unified since 2013. I might add courtesy of uh, Dale Long. I, I love my job. I love working with the children, and I love how resilient my colleagues have been given the recent changes from age groups of children that we serve in our teaching locations. While I feel fortunate to have been in the early childhood education field for 30 years, I am here to speak on behalf of new employees who are coming into the educator's profession and their ability to make teaching in Berkeley schools a long-term career. I ask the school board to treat our educators brand new and old school with dignity and offer compensation that will support the highest quality educators. Our new preschool teachers can sometimes make less than our substitute teachers. There needs to be an incentive to choose to work in this district. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Asia Long, followed by Arun Khanna. Asia Long, then Arun Khanna. Hello. My name is Asia Long. I am currently a third grade teacher at Rosa Parks Elementary School. This is my third year in BUSD and my sixth year as a licensed teacher. I'm here on a school night to tell the school board to please give us compensation offer so that I can afford to continue to be an elementary school teacher in Berkeley schools. I written Oakland. Half of my monthly salary is allocated to rent and it's about to go up in November. I have a second job at Oakland Public Library to supplement my low salary, and it shouldn't have to be this way. One job should be enough. Sometimes I work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or six days a week. The time is now. Treat us with dignity and offer compensation that is sustainable to my colleagues and me. I want to stay in this district, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to continue to do so. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Next we have Arun Khanna followed by Jason Molina. Hi, my name is Arun Khanna. I've been teaching at Ruth Acti for 13 years and I'm a parent of three kids. I grew up in this city and as much as I would like my children to grow up where I did, we can't because the cost of living has far outpaced our salary. So I'm here today to ask you, the school board, to treat us with dignity and increase the current compensation offer. I have a deep love for teaching in Berkeley schools, but have had to make difficult choices to stay. I commute an hour each way. With today's gas prices, I've had to forego paying for sports and after school activities for my own kids. And I'm ashamed to admit that I still have to ask my family members for financial help sometimes. For example, with dental bills, Delta barely covers. I pay $1,000 a month in health insurance. Despite my deep love for this community, we've reached a breaking point. My colleagues at Ruth Acti and I have given far beyond our contract hours because we care deeply about this hard work and hard work. Offer our educators what we deserve so we can continue to do the work we both love, that we do with love and dignity at Free Palestine. Thank you. Next we have Jason Molina followed by Emily Quintero. Uh, hello, my name is Jace Molina. I am uh, currently in my sixth year here at BOSD, fourth year at Longfellow. I'm a special education teacher. Um, I love the work that I do. I love the people that I serve. And um, I love to be able to continue to build relations with the, our community and with my teachers, my colleagues, and their family, site administrators are all great. And I want to give a special shout out to my colleagues, uh, the Longfellow teachers who have went through a lot with um, been through a lot, you know, like with this uh, moving changes and then the uh, principal stuff, that was really difficult, right? Um, and so I just wanted to just acknowledge how important it is for our families, particularly Longfellow, the consistency that they need for from teachers, especially special educators such as myself. I would love to spend the rest of my life at BSD if I can, but it seems as if every single year is that much more difficult with commuting and, you know, just living expenses increasing every year. Is this not matching? Um, again, I want to stay as long as I can. I see my oops. I see my sped colleagues leaving, and I want them to stay. Thank you. Next, next we have Emily Quintero, followed by Nicole Chabot. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Hi, my name is Emily Quintero. I'm a first year restorative justice counselor at Willard Middle School. I love this work because I get to see students rebuild relationships and grow into the strong leaders that aren't afraid to self-advocate for themselves. I'll let continue building relationships with students. However, the current compensation offer is not suitable for many staff members. We work in education for the passion and not the paycheck, but how for how the comedy is going, we need some more support financially so we can best serve our students and take care of our well-being as well. When I go to work, there are students that feel safe enough to let me know that they are hungry, and I try my best to support them. I moved here to Berkeley for two reasons. One of them, I believe in restorative justice, and the second is community. I almost wasn't able to move here to Berkeley because I couldn't find a place to live. And for the first two weeks, I had enormous stress um, for parking and every um, situation. As we speak, my car is in the mechanic uh, for the second time. Thank, Please, thank you, thank you so time. much. Thank you for your comments. If you weren't able to finish, please email them to the Board of Ed. Next, we have Nicole Chabot, followed by Sean Alfold. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Nicole Chabot and Sean Alfold. Good evening. My name is Nicole Chabot. I am the co-chair of the Planning and Oversight Committee, which oversees our $52 million BSEP and BARA tax measures, and I serve on the Superintendent's Budget Advisory Committee. But tonight, I'm speaking as an individual. I strongly support important discussions of reparations as a nation, but I do not believe as a school district we can push through a commitment to funding any new programs with BUSD budget in its precarious state. Last year, we had to cut $7 million from our budget. This year, we will have to cut an additional four to five million, which will be very painful. Just this week, the superintendent said this year's cuts will affect headcount programs and classrooms. Additionally, we have yet to finalize our negotiations with our teachers and staff, a process which deserves our attention and focus. 
Third, the current proposals for reparations in BUSD have not been through legal review and put us in jeopardy of lawsuits which could cost us additional millions and could only come out of funding our classrooms. Thank, thank you for your comments. Next we have Sean Alfred followed by Matthew Tabum. Sean Alfred and then Matthew Tabum. Good evening. Um, I want to start out first just by saying thank you to Superintendent Morthel, uh, Director Shinovsky, and Babbitt for your attendance at the October 7th commemoration this week. Um, it really um, means a lot. Uh, I also want to e acknowledge the email you sent Superintendent Morthel on Monday. It was an important step in the right direction. Uh, that said, there's a lot more work to be done, as evidenced by some of the language heard at yesterday's walkout. Uh, things such as chanting global intifada, which make no mistake are calls for violence to achieve political means, comments by students as they walk past a group of Israel-supporting Jews, uh, declaring, ew, it stinks, hearkening back to a classic anti-Semitic trope of the dirty Jew, signs saying Zionism is terrorism, given that 90% of Jews um, do support uh, having self-determination in a portion of our indigenous homeland, which is the definition of Zionism, this is hate speech plain and simple. That students walked out on the one year anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mati Tabum followed by Jessica P. Good evening. Um, a week or two ago was uh, United Against uh, Hate Week. Um, we're not. You've been here this past year and you know that it's not true. We're not united against hate here. There's actually, in fact, uh, a large group of people in this city, in this room, who are united around hate to me and my community. Here in this room, in our streets, in our schools, around the world. So this meeting would have gone by, as far as I know, without even mentioning October 7th. Superintendent, you couldn't even put that number on your email, nor, the, nor could Principal Rigosa. So we're not united against hate. Not acknowledging that we have a problem will not help us solve it. So if you want to be united against hate, all of you, stop saying. Thank you. Next, we have Jessica P. followed by Jessica Lee. I'm a Berkeley resident and former BUSD parent, former because my proud Jewish kids are now safely away from BUSD. Last year, my TK daughter and her first grade brother both experienced direct instances of anti-Semitism post October 7th. Despite meetings with their principal, emails to the districts and, and to the so-called complaints office, activism, despite previously standing here, and relaying to you the deeply personal and troubling accounts of what occurred at my children's school, Despite our community peacefully in conveying the pain our children have experienced from anti-Semitism in their schools through peer bullying, what teachers have worn, the fags they have flown, lessons they have taught in violation of BUSD policies and California Education Code, nothing has changed in a year, a year. At yesterday's October 8th walkout, Students screamed, globalize the intifada from the river to the sea. They yelled, ooh, it stinks, while walking past a group of identifiably Jewish students and blood libel against Israel Zionist. Next, we have Israel Carrillo, followed by Sarah Garcia. And the final uh, public comment will be by Steve Sanders. So Israel Carrillo, Sarah Garcia, and Steve Sanders. We're out of order. Can we switch? It was called out order. Can we switch? Three minutes total. Yes. Okay. So can she? Yeah, you have three minutes total. Okay. For three speakers. <clears throat> Good evening, superintendent and board of directors. My name is Sarah Garcia, and I'm a safety officer at BHS. Standing with me is your BHS safety officer team. We have come to this meeting today not only to stand in unity with our BCCE and BFT brothers and sisters, but also to let you know that our number one priority is keeping the 32 122 students at BHS safe. 
We would like to address the board regarding the letter you all received on September 19th from the safety officer team and to speak to the BHS community of parents, students, and staff to make them aware of the continuous safety hazards and unsafe working conditions that continue to plague the safety department under the current administration. Due to the administration's uh, blatant lack of concern for safety as a whole, we have an ongoing failure in communication and willingness of, an, of administration to work hand in hand with safety officers, which have led to multiple safety issues just this, school, just, just this short school year alone. We've had three incidents where students with special needs could not be located. Two of those three incidents, the students had wandered. So we have two more minutes. Uh, Ms. Tyrus, can you just give two more minutes for the two other cards that I have? And then. <laughs> two of those three incidents, the students had wandered off campus without supervision and were ultimately located off campus. Had it not been for the vigilance of safety officers, these situations could had a very different outcome. On October 4th, 2024, a student who had been a victim of a robbery in a restroom last week was physically assaulted by one of the assailants when the administration failed to notify safety officers of the suspension status of the two assailants, victimizing the student for a second time and ultimately landing him under the care of a doctor. This situation could have absolutely been prevented had the administration followed not only the ed code, but also safety protocol and notified the necessary personnel. We're asking the board to step in and hold the administrators accountable for their actions and the inability to lead BHS in a safe and positive manner. I don't know if you want to go. Uh, yeah. All right. Ms. I think we have one. one. Uh, it sounds like they don't want to use. So we. I think we can move on to the online commenters, Ms. Tyrus. We all, I only see one hand raised for public comment. Can you... Um, Please uh, unmute Ms. Falarka for, we'll give her one minute of public comment. Thank you. Um, Yvette Falarka, Berkeley Independent Studies teacher and Eon Bam Caucus. Berkeley faces teacher and staff shortages and will continue to do so as long as we are underpaid for our vital work. Berkeley teachers and staff deserve way more than a 1% raise. We are taking notes and we will remember which school board members and candidates advocated for us to get more than 1% and who opposed or remained silent. We will also remember who spoke out against Israeli genocide in Gaza and who spoke out against its wars of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Netanyahu is threatening a global catastrophe and World War III and now is not the time for the school board or anyone else to hide behind the so-called safety of silence. This school board is more than late in passing a resolution calling for an end to genocide in Gaza, in the West Bank, and now in Lebanon as well. Thank you very much. This concludes the public comment period. Thank you to everyone who came to speak. If you did not get to speak, please remember that there's an extended public comment period at the end of the meeting. Additionally, you can always email the board at boardofed at berkeley.net, or you can contact us individually. Our information is posted online at berkeley.net slash school board. Now we'll move on to committee comments. Ms. Chires, I see one of our committees here. Are there additional committees that are here? Shishak and the African American Success. Great. So we'll hear from our African American Success Advisory Committee, and we'll also hear from Gshack. And each committee has uh, five minutes. Okay. Sorry. Good evening, board directors, superintendent, and members of Berkeley community. My name is Nicole Harris, and I am tonight to provide a brief update on behalf of the BSUD African American Success Advisory Committee. I would like to start with a big thank you to the Berkeley Unified Community for its support of the Strong Start AASF Black to School Cookout, which took place on Saturday, September 14th at Willard Middle School. This event brought together BUSD students, families, City of Berkeley departments, and community organizations in support of BUSD scholars. Here are a few of the participants' feedback, 
Feedback comments. Number one, the event was very helpful and answered several questions that I had about BUSD resources, especially as heading into middle and high schools. We loved the setup and how welcoming everyone was. The amount of information available to the public, table layout, and opportunity to interact. As a guardian grandmother of a graduating BSUD, a BS, BSH senior, it was in Interesting to view all of the programs and the outreach to the community just entering the education road as well as those a bit further along. With the community spread in different neighborhoods and of different levels of income and educational backgrounds, this program informed all without stigmatizing anyone. As the school year continues, now is a great time to think about what students and families need for success. My child has been a consistent participant in the STEM programs offered by BUSD and its AASF partners. These culturally, socially, and historically relevant and rigorous programs are inspired by the legacy of Benjamin Banneker, who was an African-American naturalist, mathematician, astronomer, and almanac author. And on this day, October 9th, we will celebrate and honor his life. These programs have been both interventive and intervention and enrichment opportunities for my child. We must find ways to keep them available. Finally, the AASAC will meet virtually on October 21st, 23rd to continue its work and build connections with other BUSD advisory committees. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much for your comments tonight. Next we have G-Shack. Good evening, board and superintendent. My name is Rebecca Levinson, and I'm the co-chair of the Gender, Equity, and Sexual Harassment Advisory Committee. I've also been the adult advisor for the last 10 years for a student-led grassroots organization called Berkeley High School Stop Harassing, which is dedicated to changing the culture relative to sexual harm in BUSD. I also sit on the SBAC committee, and I'm aware of our budget cuts, and I'm also aware that when we don't fix the problem, we pay more for it. I'm here to ask you, what have you learned from the recent painful $13 million settlement that BUSD awarded to nine survivors of harm perpetrated on by BUSD's former teacher and football coach, Matt Bissell? Here's one answer. Fully fund the one program that could possibly do the most to jumpstart further improvement preventing sexual harm in Berkeley schools. What is that program? You've heard about it before. It's called Coaching Boys into Men. There is strong evidence that elite male athletes can be transformative role models in preventing a culture of, in promoting a culture of respect between students of all genders. The key to this is good coaching. I'm asking you to do something radical. I'm asking you to think about requiring that every coach who works for BUSD be trained in coaching boys into men and to pass that training along to their student athletes. Sadly, elite athletes have been a prominent part of the problem of sexual harassment culture on campus. Athletes can be a huge part of making things better if we give the tools to these coaches and to these young folks. You have already done great work funding improved Title IX compliance and consent education staffing. The request of the Bissell survivors, expand your programs and spend the money on prevention and leadership, not on students who've been harmed. When we don't spend the money on prevention, we spend greater dollars on increased insurance costs, and I know you know that's coming relative to this payout. Please expand coaching boys into men to all sports teams this year. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chavez, do we have union comments? We have union comments. If you could come approach the podium, you'll have five minutes each. I see BCCE is here to comment.
Hello, Superintendent and Berkeley School Board Directors. We are here today driven by a, an overwhelming sense of responsibility, not only towards our schools and students, but also towards the dedicated staff who labor tirelessly to maintain the smooth functioning of our educational environment. We must acknowledge with candor that there are pressing issues that can no longer be ignored. The strength and give of this district can be directly attributed to the unwavering support provided by the classified staff. BCCE quietly ensures the seamless continuation of the day-to-day -day operation from our safety officers, transportation department, to ground gardeners, all members of classified staff who work nonstop, yet their voices are left unheard. We have sat in negotiations with the district time and time again and requested information to better understand our situation, only to be met with more promises, excuses, and delays. One of our primary concerns revolve around the compensation and health benefits offered by BUSD classified employees. A significant number of classified staff have devoted 10, 20, and even 30 years of their lives to serving BUSD. They have chosen these positions with the intentions of retiring here, driven by the passion of their work and the invaluable support they provide to our student population, population on a daily basis. Many of our members have a personal connection to BUSD, BUSD with their children and even grandchildren attending our schools, representing second and third generations. Our commitment to BUSD runs deep and we yearn for the district to reciprocate that investment in us. Currently, the district faces significant challenges in recruiting classified employees without offering a more competitive compensation package. BCCE remains devoted to fulfilling our roles and supporting our students and community with passion and commitment. We harbor serious concerns regarding the allocations of funds to contractors when those resources could be invested in BUSD's permanent employees, ensuring their well-being and retention. We are constantly reminded of the superintendent's mantra, the four E's, excellent, equity, engagement, and enrichment. I believe the time has come to implement the four A's within our district, accountability, accessibility, addressing concerns, and answers to our questions. While the district often emphasizes the funds are limited, we took a closer look at the salaries and benefits of upper management that were provided by the district that reveals a different story. Administration continues to build at the top, creating high-level positions and enjoying sizable benefits, air-conditioned offices, travel compensation, nine supervisor positions. However, factually, BCCE members are doing the work. The very staff who makes this district operate and function are cast away. Our demands are not unreasonable. We are simply asking for fair wages, benefits that reflect our work ethic and respect for our work. The district continues to spend money on outside contractors while ignoring the needs of its classified staff. If the district is saying there is not enough money to take care of the very real needs of the classified staff, how can we continue to spend money on private contracts with little accountability? When there are issues, the administration shifts the blame or simply disregards the issue in their entirety. Just recently, as a student was being carried away on a stretcher, a safety officer was actively clearing the hallway to ensure the EMTs could pass quickly and safely. Despite this critical task, the supervisor, supervisor approached and began berating them for not being at their desi designated post. When the safety officer explained they were prioritizing the student's safety, the supervisor disregarded both the urgency of the situation and the well-being of the student. This lack of accountability and failure to acknowledge the immediate needs at hand reflects a serious lapse in leadership. This can no longer go on. It said there is no class without classified, and we appreciate acknowledgement. You already know we cook it, fix it, drive it, paint it, schedule it, and clean it, but we also budget it, dispatch it, garden it, purchase it, watch it, and teach it. We are classified. Enough is enough. Classified staff are the heart of this school district, and it is time for the administration to acknowledge that. We deserve dis dignity, fair treatment, and an influence while we sit at the table. No more excuses, no more passing the buck. The time has come for the district to step up and take responsibility for the well-being of its staff, or they pose risk to lose the very people who make this district function. We stand together to say today with one voice, enough is enough. <laughs> Thank you.
Now we'll hear from our Berkeley Federation of Teachers. Hello, Superintendent Ford Murthel and the Berkeley School Board Directors. I am Matt Meyer, President of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. I wanna publicly recognize all the educators and classified staff uh, in the room on a Wednesday out here because we just feel like we need to be, like we just don't feel heard and if we don't show up, we're not sure we're gonna be heard. It's hard to believe that it's October already and we still have not finished negotiating our reopeners from last year. In fact, little has occurred. The district still has not engaged in serious conversations about compensation since its initial offer in May. There have been seven board meetings since that offer and almost no progress on any proposal that has a true cost. We are now a quarter of the way into the year still discussing compensation for this year. You can see that our community is behind us and they want educators fairly compensated as well. Each of these postcards that you see displayed here is a BUSD family that BFT and BCC members spoke to one-on-one. -on -one. They agree that BFT and BCC employees deserve a fair contract and that we deserve dignity. The recruitment and retention crisis in BUSD is only deepening. Last year, we had 46 certificated hires. This year, we have 59. This is on top of record post-pandemic hiring. BUSD has contracted out educator positions because the district can't find employees to hire. These are teachers and service providers who are working on a limited time basis and have little actual ties to this district and students. And there are still vacancies. As our pay becomes less competitive year after year, there's no end in sight unless the district changes its priorities. This has a real cost to our students. All the work and time that goes into professional development each year is lost every time someone resigns. The relationships that we have built over the years disappears. Our educators work in teams and teams take time to rebuild. It can take years for a new case manager to rebuild the relationships with families, students, and staff in a program such as ours. Our newer hires end up living further and further away from the community they serve, and the number of our educators that live in Berkeley decreases every year. Our commutes to work, they get longer, decreasing the amount of time spent working with students after school. We know our families value having a stable teaching and support staff and constant staff turnover makes it harder and harder to provide the same level of service to students. Our salaries are not keeping up with our expenses. As you heard earlier, both new and veteran educators have been faced with steep increases to our personal budgets, whether it's rent, healthcare, childcare, or transportation. We need to be able to take care of our own economic well-being so we can remain in this community. This is a significant risk to the high quality public education we provide in Berkeley schools as our salaries become increasingly uncompetitive with our neighbors. This district is spending over 60% more over a five year time period in upper management salaries. The same claims the district uses to justify these increases applies to us as well. Education can't happen without educators and classified staff who work with students day in and day out. If other districts can find ways to compensate its employees, the USD should be able to as well. Looking at the district provided data, previous salary increases have not improved our standing with our neighboring districts. We believe the district needs to do a real analysis of its expense structures. BFT is happy to participate in that process. As professionals who seek to make a career here with dignity, the community has our backs. It is well past time for this board to prioritize these issues and make a good faith effort to get to an agreement with its labor partners. Thank you. What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want?
Thank you again to everyone who came to speak to us. We will now hear from our board members. Before we start board member comments tonight, I'd like to remind our colleagues to review our governance team commitments. Our full list of governance team commitments can be found on our board meeting agendas. Let's be the best role models that we can be for our students. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for their comments who would like to go first. Anyone? Director Ching? Um, because we have some exciting uh, conversation coming up that I'm looking forward to. I'm just going to be really, really quick. Um, thanks, everybody. Hold on, Director Chang. I think we're going to get the door so we can hear your comments. Um, okay, I'll proceed. I just want to say again, uh, thanks to all the folks who came out here um, and exercised their right of speech and advocacy. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, there was a recent anniversary as was has been raised, of, co of course, uh, across um, the country. And this is a challenging time. And, you know, I want to reflect that I think Myself and the board members and the district have, of course, empathy for um, all those who have been harmed and for the very challenging circumstances that we're in uh, right now in the past year. Um, and so um, I hope that this school year um, will be another opportunity to have a conversation again with you, um, but also to um, understand, you know, our stakeholders in the community and the impact of um, on our students and how we can continue to provide a healthy environment for all of our students. Um, other than that, you know, policy, policy, policy for me. Been meeting a lot on policy committee, um, also DLAC, and um, I'm going to keep it short again. So thank you very much for coming out and uh, and having us listen in here. Thank you. Thank you, Director Chang. Who'd like to go next? Director Babbitt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to uh, definitely say I, much, I do love the four E's, but shout out to those four A's by our classified union. Um, and also want to say um, also good evening to everyone. And I want to offer my uh, heartfelt condolences to Day Long's, Dale Long's family, his BUSD colleagues, specifically at Franklin Preschool. I understand he was a dedicated preschool teacher in BUSD for more than 20 years, and we know that our community will feel his loss deeply. For many in our community, as the anniversary of October 7th's Hamas attack and subsequent war launched, this season continues to be intensely personal, filled with intensely personal trauma and grief. Now is the moment for the BUSD community to continue to come together to provide space for grieving and healing. In honor of those who have lost loved ones and are hurting, I want to read this poem written by Berkeley-born Hirsch Goldberg Poland's mother after his death. It's called One Tiny Seed. There is a lullaby that says your mother will cry a thousand tears before you grow to be a man. I have cried a million tears in the last 67 days. We all have. And I know that way over there, there's another woman who looks just like me because we are all so very similar and she has also been crying. All those tears, a sea of tears, they all taste the same. Can we take them, gather them up, remove the salt and pour them over our desert of despair? and plant one tiny seed. A seed wrapped in fear, trauma, pain, war, and hope, and see what grows. Could it be that this woman, so very like me, that she and I could be sitting together in 50 years, laughing without teeth, because we have drunk so much sweet tea together. And now, we are so very old, and our faces are creased, like worn out brown paper bags. And our sons 
have their own grandchildren, and our sons have long lives, one of them without an arm, but who needs two arms anyway? Is it all a dream, a fantasy, a prophecy, one tiny seed? BOSD, as we strive to move forward together, please remember that having empathy for the loss of life and the trauma of people of all nations and faith is a core value of a welcoming school environment. My hope is that we will all demonstrate the compassion, care, humanity for each other that we wish for this world. As true drum majors for, injustice, for justice, let's continue to strive for acceptance over tolerance, inclusion over diversity, and love over hate. Thank you. Thank you, Director Babbitt. Um, would anyone else like to continue their board comments? Yes, and Director Wendt Clark. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, that was a really beautiful performance from the Sylvia Mendez kids and definitely made my week. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the many familiar faces of the incredible teachers and staff that came today. They have gone above and beyond in their dedication to students, and I've been able to experience that firsthand, having been a part of BUSD since the second grade. So we deeply appreciate their hard work and commitment, and I just want to express my gratitude for everything they do. Um, this past month has been incredibly eventful and exciting for Berkeley High and BTEC students. We've made significant process, particularly regarding Measure Y1 and student pre-registration efforts. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to organize pre-registration events in collaboration with various clubs. And I've visited classes and student organizations at Berkeley High to encourage more students to get pre-registered. We are continuing, we're planning to continue this effort right up till the deadline. Um, and for any Berkeley High students listening, be sure to use the QR code linked in my Instagram and which will be soon available in the bulletin to get your class pre-registered. I'm proud to share that over the past week with the help of partner clubs, we're already, we've already pre-registered at least 100 students and I'm eager to continue that momentum. Um, and to the teachers listening, please make sure to remind your students to pre-register since this is such an important opportunity and it's important for students to recognize their impact. Um, I'd also like to highlight the recent school board candidate forum, which was organized by our school's Civic Leaders Club and took place last night. I had the honor of co-moderating the event alongside another student, and it was honestly an incredible experience. Um, not only was it highly educational for those who attended, but we also saw a strong student turnout, and we were able to pre-register even more students on site. Uh, the forum was a fantastic success, and I'm proud of everyone who participated and helped out in the event. I look forward to continuing this important work and building on the energy we've created. Thank you. Thank you, student director. And next, I'd like to go, Director Shinovsky. Yeah, I just want to jump on that um, highlight. Um, I was able to attend the candidate forum, and I was so impressed with the group of students, uh, Eva Levinson, Jules Droz, and our very own Winter Clark. Um, it was just really well done, very professional. Um, everybody stayed on time, which was amazing. Um, so really big shout out. Um, and again, I just want to highlight, um, it's a historic moment. Um, and so all of our 16 and 17 year olds have a chance to register to vote and to um, get out there and select uh, their next school board members. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the teachers and classified staff that were here today to speak about their importance and that they really are the bedrocks of our schools. Um, as a parent of two kids and a single mom, um, they were like a set, they still are like a second family to me. Um, the classified staff, you know, took care of my kids every single day after school for elementary school. Uh, we didn't take the bus, but if we had, they would have been caring for them then too. Um, and the teachers, uh, I mean, it, it's too much to even go into. So please know that um, I am grateful every single day for BUSD, for the classified and the teachers that serve our kids and serve our communities so faithfully um, day in, day out. Oh, wait, and I have office hours tomorrow um, at Casa Latina. 
but I have to leave a little bit early. So my office hours are gonna be three to four tomorrow. Um, if anyone wanted to come later and they're devastated by that um, early dismissal, uh, just give me a shout out and I'll go back another time and get some more um, sweetbreads and meet you for coffee. Thanks. Thank you, Director Shinovsky and Vice President Brown. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Latinx Heritage Month, uh, Filipino Heritage Month, and LGBTQ plus Heritage Month. Um, I'd like to thank those who spoke tonight in regards to um, the Disability Equity and Special Education Advisory Committee um, and increased compensation offer for our educators here in BUSD. I'd like to thank those who spoke tonight in regards to reparations, the ongoing impacts of the war, safety at Berkeley High School, as well as the advisory comments received from the African American um, Success Framework Advisory Committee, GSHAC, BCCE, and BFT. I would like to give a shout out to our incredible Berkeley High students, Eva Levinson, Joelle Droz, and our very own member of the dais, Ms. Winter Clark, who held an important community event yesterday in preparation for this upcoming election. Uh, it is not our practice to speak about campaign items in the boardroom, so I will really take this opportunity to celebrate how proud I was to see the partnership that happened along with um, our students and the League of Women Voters who supported a voter registration drive to ensure that our 16 and 17 year olds are able, uh, are registered to vote and that they get the unique opportunity to exercise their right to vote as the inaugural class of Vote 16ers. Um, thank you again to our students for the positive contributions that you are already making to our community and ultimately the world. Thank you to uh, the many, many community members who sent us emails in regards to this evening's agenda item on reparations. In their emails, they identified uh, that the board agreed to bring back reparations in the fall, and this evening we are doing just that. Uh, in the emails that we received, uh, they identified that the proposals recommended by the district reparations task force are grounded in extensive community outreach, expert consultation, and that these recommendations um, have been made through research into existing uh, reparations frameworks and um, implementing these, I just would like to say that implementing these recommendations um, will significantly address the enduring impacts of chattel slavery uh, that has been, um, that we've seen here in BUSD and other parts of our community. Despite um, this evening's comment, we have not yet learned the fiscal impacts of reparations. And so to that comment, uh, commenter and to my board members, um, I'd like to say let's honor the work of the district created task force and give their recommendations a fair shot instead of oppressing them before we even know the facts. I think that that is very important. We do that with all of the work that we receive and let's continue uh, to lead with that process. I'd like to um, take the time to identify those um, in our communities who have been impacted and continue to be impacted uh, by the hurricane as um, the death toll continues to rise and as all of us continue to see what's happening on the news. I know that our hearts go out to those impacted. Many folks um, have lost their homes and their cars and their personal possessions and some even have lost their lives. And so my heart goes out to them and I'm sure my board members um, also share that sentiment. Finally, it has been a year and two days since the entire world has been turned upside down. It has been a year and two days since we've witnessed from the quote unquote comfort of our own homes, one of the worst humanitarian crises in our lifetimes. It has been a year and two days of famine and hunger, a year and two days of the shortages of clean water, a year and two days of no access to electricity in some communities and a year and two days of a lack of access um, to medicine as we know 
that there is at least 19 hospitals that have closed and the number continues to rise. It has been a year and two days since there have been 1,200 deaths and about 8,700 injuries that have occurred in Israel. And a year and two days um, as the numbers continue to rise in Gaza with about 41,700 deaths and 96,700 injuries. It has been a year and two days since our communities here in the United States have also been impacted, divided, mourned, and lean on the promises of peace. We cannot continue a ye another year and two days like the ones we have just seen go by. We must continue to call for peace. We must call for action and we must call for change. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Brown. Keep my comments short for tonight. I also um, just wanted to echo the appreciation that my colleagues shared for our Sylvia Mendez students who came to perform today and the district staff for organizing that presentation. I also want to thank staff uh, for attending the City of Berkeley's Latino Heritage Month on September 29th. Had the pleasure of speaking at the event and also of seeing our Fuente program there, our King Middle School's Latine Club. It was really beautiful to see the students sell agua frescas and talk to them about the work that they're doing at King and um, to see our OFI staff members engaging with families. So I want to thank the district staff that went above and beyond to be there. I know it's not easy to work on a weekend, so really appreciate you all and our Associate Superintendent, I also like walking around. So thank you for attending that event. I'm grateful to all the educators that came to speak and quite frankly, feeling really sad about what it means to work in our district when it compensation doesn't feel right. And so um, today was really hard and I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate you coming out and sharing all your experiences with us tonight. I want to give a shout out to our superintendent for being a wonderful partner and our special education staff and our special education families uh, in the launch of the Disability Equity and Special Education Advisory Committee, DCAC, um, which is kicking off this month. I'm very excited about that and more to come, um, but also just really excited to elevate the concerns of our special ed students and continue to work to make sure that they feel a strong sense of belonging in our district. And part of that is having that authentic, proactive engagement with their families. So thank you, Superintendent, for that. And I also want to thank Superintendent and staff uh, for launching uh, the, I mean, we've already had a series of our safety committee meetings, but they're starting again on the 17th. So I'm very excited about that. Just our district-wide approach to addressing school safety. I recently attended a meeting in San Mateo and they really promote this program called the Big Five, um, which they use, uh, it's, a, it's promoted by the county office, but it trickles down to all the districts on how they address safety. It's also been adopted by Monterey County's Office of Education. So got to speak uh, to their county superintendent and also by Marin's uh, County Office of Education. So I will be emailing the Big Five to my board colleagues, you can read it, <laughs> and also to our uh, County Superintendent, Elise Castro. Um, this is something for us to consider as we made investments to better address safety in our schools. And with that, um, I will move to the consent calendar. Colleagues, can I get a motion in a second to approve tonight's consent calendar? I move. Moved by Director Shinovsky, is there a second? I second. Seconded by Director Chang. All directors in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's or abstentions? Nope. Seeing none, the motion passes. Now, colleagues, I'm gonna call for a five minute break as we set up our, uh, our presentation agenda item 14.1. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. 
You guys eat?
Oh man, I'm so tired. Okay, break time's over, friends. All right, board directors, getting ready for agenda item 14.1. Good evening, Superintendent. We'll be introducing this agenda item. Good evening, board directors. This is uh, discussion item 14.1. It is an update on from the reparations task force. And I'm going to ask if uh, Liz can put up the PowerPoint. While she is getting the PowerPoint on the screen, I'll go ahead and start. But what you know is always my first slide, and that is our mission statement to enable and inspire a diverse student body to achieve academic excellence and make positive contributions to the world. I am here with the reparations update, October 9th, 2024. I'm just taking my time so that the presentation can get up. Thank you very much, Liz. Here we are. So before starting, I wanted to just provide some background and a little bit of a reminder both to um, our board of directors as well as to public or anyone who is listening. The BUSD Reparations Task Force uh, came to be after George Floyd's murder. The community started exploring reparations in BUSD. Um, it culminated in the request of BUSD of the board uh, to establish a reparations task force the board approved that request and the district announced a task force in March, 2023. The purpose of the reparations task force was to provide the district with recommendations regarding one, what do reparations look like? Two, how could BUSD fund reparations? And three, how can and should BUSD implement such a program? The reparations task force again was announced on March, 2023. It was composed of 15 members a diverse group of folks from the BUSD and Berkeley community, including community members, parents, staff, as well as students. That task force met 13 times last school year between April 2023 and June 2024. They did a number of things, including researching existing reparations frameworks and looking at examples of reparations. They also consulted with experts and they administered community surveys and organized community engagements uh, to make sure that the community was having input and staying abreast of the work they were doing. There's also a BUSD Reparations Task Force website where they were able to post uh, agendas and artifacts um, so that the community can stay engaged with the work throughout the year. On June 12, 2024, that group came before you, the Board of Education, to present recommendations, and they came with one ask of you all on that day. And that ask is here on this slide. There was no vote scheduled for that meeting on June 12th. The task force simply asks that you, the Board of Education, commit to fully exploring the task force recommendations in the fall. Again, that was June 12th, 2023. No, that's not true. That was June 12th, 2024. And we are now here in the fall. And I'm coming to provide that update to you as the board did agree to ask me and staff to explore the recommendations. Uh, the, sorry. the Reparations Task Force uh, made three recommendations to you, the Board of Education. These, rep these uh, recommendations are not necessarily in any particular order, but I will share them with you and remind you of them now. 
One recommendation was to create a harm report, which was to document activities by BUSD that negatively and positively impacted descendant students, as well as reparative, sorry, reparative activities that BUSD has undertaken. The other recommendation was to develop, adopt, and deploy curricula on the history and legacy of chattel slavery at the federal, state, and local levels. And the third recommendation was to provide financial payments for educational purposes to BUSD descendant students. The task force also came to the Board of Education with some ideas or recommendations on how we could fund those efforts. And those two are here for your uh, recollection. The first, again, no particular order, was to solicit philanthropic corporate giving, which would involve soliciting voluntary donations from philanthropic foundations and corporations. Initiate a lawsuit was another idea or recommendation by BUSD against those private entities whose historic activities connected to the legacy of shadow slavery have led to lower funding for BUSD today. Another recommendation or possible idea for funding these recommendations in the previous slide was to propose a tax measure via initi initiative, a parcel tax or a real estate transfer tax, with efforts being made to minimize the impact on descendant taxpayers. The task force did a little bit more work and also shared and suggested some potential next step with you, the Board of Education. Those steps are listed here. The district can contract with outside experts to create a harm report. Again, that was one of their recommendations. And here they were just giving some ideas of how that recommendation could come to life. The district could hire or contract with experts should include uh, descendant BUSD staff to develop curriculum. So if we were going to go with the curriculum recommendation, they were saying that maybe we want to consider hiring someone, but whoever we do that work with, that it should include uh, descendant BUSD staff members. The district could hire staff to write, submit grant proposals, and or to apply pressure on and attention to corporations to fund any of these recommendations could consult with attorneys to more thoroughly and analyze legal theories and options to pursue. And if we uh, were open to the idea of the board took the recommendation of pursuing uh, monies through taxes uh, for either tax, they clarified that no action is required by the district as tax would need to be placed on ballot via community led initiative. These are uh, three summary slides that uh, attempt to capture again, months and months of work and a very detailed report that the task force submitted to the board of education. Again, their ask at the end of that presentation on June 12th was that uh, you direct me to further explore their recommendations, um, and you did so, and that is again why I'm here today. So the purpose of this discussion item is just for that, to give you an update on what we've explored, what we've found um, around the recommendations to date, as well as share some of our learnings and actions that we plan to take going forward. Again, one of the recommendations uh, or one of the ideas that the task force offered was for us to get uh, a more detailed legal analysis. Um, in fact, in the presentation on June 12th, a couple of board directors actually asked that question as well. Um, I wanna provide this update first, that we have had an initial preliminary legal analysis of the recommendations to date. So again, we had a preliminary legal analysis, but it is preliminary and high level. Um, because it is attorney-client privilege, I will be sharing um, the information from that initial analysis with the board for our usual protocols of sharing these types of information. I do want to name that there is still more room for analysis and that if we decide to continue uh, to have a more detailed or more rigorous um, analysis of the recommendations, uh, we should consider, as the task force recommended, um, outreaching to uh, others for pro bono legal analysis and advice, or if we choose to not do that, or if that only is able to subsidize some of the costs, we will have to have a conversation around the budget to identify budgets to have a more detailed, again, legal analysis. But I did wanna make sure that it is clear to, again, the board, as well as folks who are listening, that we did take that recommendation or suggestion from the task force seriously, and there has been some legal analysis of each of the recommendations provided in the report. Uh, again, another recommendation for perhaps the first recommendation that the task force uh, brought forth was uh, the creation of a harm report. 
The harm report will be a primary source uh, with research, historical data on student outcomes and interviews. So that will be the information that is gathered to inform the harm report. It would detail the institutional activities by BUSD that impact the descendant students, as well as the reparative actions, any reparative actions that BUSD has attempted to implement or has implemented, and how those things have been undertaken. I will say that even though I said before in this task force said it as well, that there is no specific order uh, for these recommendations, it is true that the data from a harm report will be very important data to inform uh, the remedies and educational strategies and or the responses of the district. And so for that reason, we did spend more time looking at this particular recommendation. If you're thinking about the recommendation for curriculum, we would want to use information from the harm report to make sure that the curriculum that is designed for BUSC students are responsive to their experiences as descendants. I want to say that again. So even though the recommendations from the task force are not in any particular order, we spent more time with the harm report because, again, it provides foundational data that can then inform whatever next steps that the board directs or staff takes in response to the findings. In that exploration, what we found um, by talking to um, different entities is that there's an estimated cost for a harm report of about $50,000. Um, and the reason why that I say about $50,000 is because there aren't honestly tons of examples of harm reports to go off of. And so we were talking to organizations that either have created them or who have tried to create them, and that was the estimated cost we were provided. The recommendation that I am making and the recommendation that the task force also made was that if we are to proceed with this, this harm report and we now understand or have a better idea of the cost, that we should solicit support. The task force did not recommend that these dollars or the entirety of the cost of the harm report come out of BUSD funds. Again, they were pretty creative and innovative and gave us suggestions as well as how we can acquire these dollars. And so um, we did submit a grant uh, for matching funds uh, to Liberated Ventures, which is an organization that is well known for their work around reparations and an organization that actually provided technical assistance to the task force during their time last year. And so again, in the spirit of recognizing um, the current fiscal climate that we're in, even ahead of that, because they made the recommendation last year, um, the task force asked that we solicit foundation support and we have initiated that support. No results yet from that inquiry, but I wanted to make sure the board knew that we did submit a grant for a match funding. Match funding means we would pay the 25,000 and the uh, Liberated Ventures would pay the other 25,000. I also wanted to share um, the estimated timeline for a harm report. Again, that information was not available. And so that is something that came out of our exploration. When you do a harm report, well, we would, when we do a harm report, we would want to do requests for proposals. What that means is that we would actually put out a description of the project, the goals, what we desire to get out of the project of the harm report. We would have a budget, we would have a timeline, requirements and metrics. And so basically we would put that together, a request for proposals and then kind of open it up. Organizations um, or institutions that do harm reports would then bid uh, to be able to compile and write the USD's harm report. That process typically takes about three months, and that's not unique to uh, a harm report for, um, I'm sorry, RFP for harm reports, just in general. Um, that's the ballpark for RFPs. It could be longer, um, but typically is not less than three months. We also understand that to compile the, the historic data, to do the interviews, and then to write the harm report will take some time. And so we estimated about six to nine months for that. And so you can see that the entire process of creating uh, and finalizing the harm report can take anywhere from nine months to 12 months. Uh, because of that, and again, because the harm report uh, should be and could be a very foundational document to inform our responses uh, as a district, we do believe that the harm report is kind of the first and most important thing to do. And as such, this is why this is the part that we explored the most. And what I would like to recommend, what staff would like to bring forward a proposal to you all, our board, uh, sometime in October, just again, because of the time it's going to take to do the RFP and to write the report so that we could have some information to respond to uh, by the beginning of next year. We would also need time to draft the language for the RFP or the request for proposal. So again, this is why we spent the most time on the harm report, and this is the area that has the most information and the area that I would like to bring back more information and a proposal to you all for the month of October. 
I can stop and take questions uh, for each recommendation, or I can go through this entirety. Again, it's just updates, just like the ones I provided. What do you all prefer? Directors, any preference? Right, keep keep going. going. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. So the other recommendation was to develop a curriculum, um, specifically a curriculum on the institution of chattel slavery. We, uh, in the task force report, it was recommended that we use the California task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African-Americans, the CARTF, to inform that curriculum. And they also identified a professor at UC Berkeley, Professor Talani Brighton, that is developing a curriculum in partnership with the California Department of Justice, specific lesson plans, K-12, that incorporate that CARTF report. Sorry, I didn't change the slide. Um, and so our next steps around the curriculum is to really dive deeper into that CARTF report to understand what's in it, to see how it might inform instruction, how it might inform curriculum, and to see if there's any places in our current curriculum where some of those uh, particular points or components already exist. We also are excited to uh, make time to meet with Professor Talani Brighton to get a sense of where they are in creating this curriculum, um, and again, seeing how that curriculum might fit in the BUSD instructional landscape. We also just want to investigate and research our existing curriculum to find out where, if anywhere, there's already um, information and historical uh, background around shadow slavery to see if there is places that we can already um, just in a make sense way build on this particular curriculum development. We also want to consider a committee or working group to further explore other curricular resources. Again, Professor Brighton was one that was recommended by the task force, but there might well be other resources, other professors, or other people who have already compiled uh, curriculum on shadow slavery that we could either adopt or enhance or expand on. And so we would think about a committee to do that work um, and find out, again, where it might fit in our course offerings and other implementation considerations. So that's the update on that next recommendation around creating curriculum on shadow slavery and where we are and where we plan to go. The final recommendation of the task force was financial payments for educational purposes to BUSD descendant slaves. Again, the task force went above and beyond to not just say do something, but give us some ideas of how we might actually do it. Uh, they offered three ideas for financial payments. Again, solicit philanthropic corporate giving, initiate a lawsuit by BUSD, and propose a tax measure via um, initiative. This is the one that we've made the least progress on in terms of um, exploration and update. What we are working on is to create a report for our board to understand what are the implications, um, the impacts, uh, and the implementation requirements for each of these particular um, funding options. What we need to do to solicit philanthropic corporate giving, what type of staff time, Will be any costs, if any, um, that are associated with that? What would putting together a lawsuit look like? And then we're also thinking about considering a working group or some type of partnership to identify how we might solicit funds for this. Again, remember when I started, I said that we have done an initial preliminary legal analysis of each of the recommendations, and that is both the recommendations in terms of harm report, curriculum, and financial payments, as well as a legal analysis around these ways of generating the dollars, soliciting corporate funds, initiating a lawsuit, and proposing a tax measure. And so, of course, we will, again, share this with the board, and those findings will definitely be considered by the board as we think about how we might fund financial payments if that is the way that the board chooses to proceed. Those are the updates uh, we would have liked. I would have personally liked to have had more to say that we have done or developed or understand as a result of the hard work of the task force since June 12th. But as you know, a lot happened um, after June 12th in terms of moving sites, et cetera. Um, but we wanted to make sure to stop and do this update as we did say to the task force and the community that we would in fall. And we do wanna make it clear that we do really um, value their work and their efforts and we are, um, intent on continuing to explore their recommendations um, going forward. So that's it. I'm open to questions and discussion. Um, and the questions can also remember that I'm not the task force. And so uh, it's really about the, the questions, hopefully about you know what we've found or what we're going to do next. And then also specifically, if there's any questions that the board would like us to answer as we continue to explore, that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Director Shinovsky. I just have one question. Um, first, I want to reiterate my support for the work of the task force, and I'm really glad that it didn't get lost in the shuffle of things and that we're getting this um, update. 
I my one question is about the legal advice and so you may not be able to answer it but I know that there are concerns from the community about even doing a harm report and what that might do to the district legally so if you can't answer the question, then I guess I'm just making a comment that I want to be careful um, that we at least have that advice and we go into into that first step, which I also agree makes sense as a first step with our eyes wide open. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shinovsky. Any other directors? Director Jane? Yes, thank you so much. <clears throat> and. Uh... In the same uh, spirit as Director Shinaski noted, um, I think it's really important we started this conversation. And I support, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I support um, uh, having these conversations about reparations and reparations as a policy outcome. Um, and so that policy outcome aspect is really important. I know you've, there's been a really busy year. There has been a very busy past school year, and there have been some conversations with the reparations task force since they came. And I think it's really important to put in place the type of process that's necessary for uh, a successful policy-based outcome that's um, not only vetted from a uh, introductory standpoint in terms of the initial um, pockets of recommendations. You have these three um, uh, types of reparations. Um, but also throughout the process, I think it's really important to have legal counsel involved. And um, to me, as an attorney, I think it's really relevant in particular as you're getting to the point where um, there is a conversation about specifically um, where the remedy is going to come from, both financing-wise, but also how the remedy is going to be structured. Um, and there are going to be complex questions about the role of the school board as a governance board and questions about roles of legislative bodies that are typically the, um, the venue at which uh, successful reparations programs, which I understand there in the modern time, there haven't been many, but there are some, which the reparations task force came and described really helpfully. Um, typically, they've been run through um, legislative bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so my prior recommendation some time ago uh, and my question was um, to what degree has um, this task force had the time to engage with the city of Berkeley's reparations task force and also to consider engagement with um, city of Berkeley council as well. Um, they have attorneys there too that can uh, possibly provide support as well um, uh, as you proceed uh, because counsel is going to be expensive you know you will have pro bono counsel but I think it's also important just to have the perspective of city and or district counsel as well thank you um, superintendent do you want to answer those questions and then move on to vice president Brown Oh, sorry. I kind of heard those more as recommendations in terms of some next steps. And those next steps that I heard was possibly partnering with or somehow uh, engaging with the City of Berkeley's Reparation Task Force, as well as uh, City of Berkeley Council, and then just being mindful that pro bono counsel is helpful counsel, but we will also want to engage in our own council in City of Berkeley. So yes, I received that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Thank you so much, Superintendent, uh, for this presentation and for this update. I was really excited uh, when we first received this presentation in June that every single board member uh, on this dais expressed uh, their support for reparations and their excitement about this information coming back in the fall. And so thank you so much for bringing it back. Uh, just to kind of center us, I want to make sure that we all fully understand that we have already had legal a legal analysis um, a few, I'm sure, uh, on this uh, reparations recommendations uh, that are coming to us. And so we've taken care of that. Um, and just a reminder to the board, uh, you will be informed of that information as the superintendent has already expressed. In addition to that, um, you said that we could conti continue to seek more uh, legal analysis if that's what our desire is, but if we've already done that, I think it is in our best interest to really focus on the recommendations that were brought forth before us. And I believe that that is the, um, the uh, scope of our work this evening. 
Um, I want to identify um, that in addition to uh, talking about the payments, which we are actually the furthest uh, from in terms of uh, the work that we've already, we, I say the district, um, has already been exploring as it relates to reparations. Um, we know we already have those identified uh, funding source recommendations, as well as the recommendations around the curricula. Um, and so I really want us to spend time focusing on the harm report, which is the item that you're bringing forth to us this evening. Um, I think it is really uh, incredible that you know, there is, of course, going to be um, some small fiscal impact. And I call that small in comparison to uh, what we uh, what we fund and what resources we put out there uh, with other items. And so this small uh, fiscal impact for the harm report uh, should be something that we could handle as a school district. And I think it's also incredibly important that the task force offered opportunities to save, even save money. Um, earlier, you mentioned uh, that we may qualify for a grant uh, that will help us match funds. And that uh, line item that you talked about was $50,000 $50, $50, impact for the harm report. Um, however, the grant would match that funds, and so it would not be a $50,000 impact to our uh, general fund, however, a $25,000 impact. Um, and I just want to identify that this um, grant is not just one that was applied for by the task force as a fly-by-night um, grant, but uh, the school district was actually uh, recommended to apply for this grant because um, the work that we're doing around reparations has made national news and uh, made headways. And so people are really excited about what we're doing in Berkeley Unified School District. Um, and so uh, the invitation came uh, in that way. So what we need to do as a board uh, is make a decision around um, moving forward with the harm report, especially because um, we, you know, we can't kick the can down the road. This is definitely something that is time sensitive um, as it impacts, or there are implications rather, as it relates to the RFP process. And so um, if we are not going to vote tonight, I see it's listed as a discussion item and not as an action item. If we are not going to uh, vote on bringing the uh, proposal forward for the harm report, as well as the draft language for the RFP. I would really like to see this come to our next agenda on October 30th. Um, as you mentioned, it will come back to us sometime in October. And so um, those are not questions at all, just a recap, um, a, a recap of what you shared, uh, centering us in what we're actually supposed to be uh, making a decision on tonight, and then a recommendation to bring this back uh, on our agenda as a vote. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vice President Brown, and thank you to my colleagues for raising your concerns. I think for me, Superintendent, I'm really, I just want to say thank you for all the work that's gone into this and for following up on the legal analysis. I think it would be helpful for me as a member of this governance team to be able to have a closed session discussion so we can ask questions about the legal analysis that's been done. It's hard for me to think of taking action right now when I haven't seen it. I haven't had like a q and I really, you know, as a mm -hmm. governance team member, need to understand um, the risks of putting together a harm report, what that means for the district legally, and have the opportunity to engage with council. So from my perspective, I think it'd be really important to agendize that closed session discussion before we take any action item. I also really like the idea that you propose of exploring our own curriculum and kind of, you know, what knowledge we have in-house. So we'd love to just get more information on that as a board member. Like, what can we do that's cost neutral now versus anything that requires an expense? So given um, the budgetary situation, the critical decisions that we have to make on compensation, I just feel like I would love to be able to have more information and also understand like what's cost neutral that we can start now and what can we potentially defer to our regular budgetary process. Thanks. Can I make sure I understand correctly? Um, in terms of uh, curricula, which you, um, which you spoke to, uh, and having that done in-house. Right now, we are not receiving any information about any fiscal implications of the curricula. I just want to make sure I understand that correctly. Correct. The only um, fiscal implications that we are talking about right now is as it relates to the harm report. I, I just want to make sure I understand fully. Okay, right. thank you. Dr. Babbitt. 
Thank you so much for honoring the commitment to, to bring this back and for um, moving forward. I really appreciate the application to the grant. Looking forward to um, hopefully receiving those funds. Um, and also want to just caution us when we talk about um, the curriculum piece. Uh, you know, we know we just adopted last fall uh, a curriculum that starts and stops with slavery when we when we did our social studies curriculum adoption. Um, and so I just want us to make sure that we're careful about how we teach and how we uh, focus on uh, chattel slavery, because that also will most likely, I'm sure, show up in our harm report, mm -hmm. given our history of teaching teaching black history starting and stopping with just slavery. So we really need to be very um, uh, intentional about our cultural competency work as well, even right now, as we have been teaching and as you know, we adopted that curriculum, which I wasn't here to not support, but <laughs> um, so that is my uh, my recommendation for that, that part of, um, the, the task force recommendations. Thank you. I know I know that was not a question, um, Director Babbitt, but I did want to just piggyback off of that and um, say that you are right and that there are likely things that come out of the harm report that might inform not only how we design the curriculum and what's in the curriculum, but also how we implement and teach the curriculum. And that's again why we, you know, even though the task force did not put the recommendations in any order, that's again why we kind of are lifting the harm report, if you will, as, as the first uh, step. And that is why, again, we came to you all with a little bit more detail, not a lot, but a little bit more detail about what that would entail. And again, um, aware of the costs of, of the $50,000 or the estimated $50,000. And that is, again, why we applied for the grant, because we know that it's not only timely, but again, it's kind of the, the, the thing that will inform, that should inform um, the curriculum, how we implement it, but also will give us a lot of information as we, as the board might consider the pay as well. Director G. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for that question. Uh, I just want to piggyback on that. Um, yeah, to to the degree that I think that is possible, which I think is very possible, um, for as governance members, we'd like to see um, organic local talent being used, in particular district talent. Um, we have a African American Studies Department at VHS, which is highly regarded um, and has been around for decades. I think this is also a really great opportunity to lean in on the really great ethnic studies curriculum that we have. African American Studies is a, a part of ethnic studies. Um, oftentimes, it may be in its own departmental um, organizational structure because um, some of the programs. Um, preceded ethnic studies, but ethnic studies was based upon that framework. And mm -hmm. in most cases, in the post-secondary context in particular, ethnic studies and African-American studies departments work very closely together and share faculty. Um, right here in our neighborhood, we have um, faculty in African-American studies at UC Berkeley um, and in ethnic studies, again, uh, some of whom have come to the school board to provide some guidance. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a really strong opportunity to pull in uh, local allies and to develop curriculum uh, and have a, a do so in a way that shows that um, we're acknowledging the strength of our own district and our employees here. Thank you. Thanks, Superintendent. Um, I just, I see your hand, I suppose. I was just gonna say, um, back to the philanthropic opportunities, as you're checking in with the city of Berkeley, would love to know also if they can contribute to the cost of the harm report since they're also doing some some work with their own committee. So I think that's, I don't know if that's like a two by two conversation or we might just want to ask them and kind of where they're at and if they could support the district. Vice President Brown. 
Yes. Um, can I, I'd just like to share, uh, while we definitely want to make sure that we are in partnership um, with the city, I must identify that we are actually a few steps ahead of uh, the city and their work around reparations. Um, and I'm excited to partner, but I know that we are in a space where they will be able to learn more from us than we will uh, learn from them at this time because of how far we are uh, in our process. And so they've not made um, any progress as much as us and still have not yet um, identified a consultant. And so I want us to um, not put ourselves in a position to take a step back, waiting for them, waiting for their update, um, but move forward, especially because BUSD can stand along and stand strong as our own, as our own entity um, and, and know and lean on the progress that we've already made. Additionally, um, I would like to ask, I think I was pretty clear around um, we mentioned around the uh, analysis, um, the legal analysis, and so I, I want to hear from my board colleagues. Um, we will get that information, potentially have it um, as a closed session item, but what specifically um, are you all looking for or questioning or would like to know? I'd like to hear from each of my colleagues about um, what kind of legal analysis we are you're mentioning or looking for. Yeah, Director Shinovsky. Specifically, what I would like to understand is whether or not a harm report leaves us open to um, open to any kind of thank you anticipated lit litigation or future litigation. And I'd just like to be sure that we are able to, that I'm able to feel really comfortable with that. And also that we can make sure that our um, community is comfortable um, with pursuing that. Yeah. Oops, excuse me. Direct about it. <laughs> yeah, for me, the harm is in the data. I mean, <laughs> African Americans have had literally a class action lawsuit case against BUSD for years, just based on our our results. So I'm not sure if a harm report is going to uh, actually uncover anything that our data hasn't already been telling us for for years within BUSD of the direct um, educational harm that we have been really a part of with institutional racism existing. Um, so I say often when I started as a parent advocate for equity, it was because the white principal told me straight up that the data was telling BUSD that the results of our achievement gap was based on institutional racism. And they knew it primarily because no matter the background, the socioeconomic background, college education level of the parents, the results were the same for African-American students. Um, and even when I was running for the school board in 2020, the professor uh, at Cal was having the same conversation that many black parents had had, not understanding why educators were saying his child couldn't read and his child was reading at higher levels at home than they were allowed to read in our classrooms. So for me, um, I think the harm report is meant to show what Berkeley Unified is showing reparations for or trying to repair, but our data can tell us that. So thank you. Dr. Chung. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, I, I think the uh, thank you, uh, Director Babbitt, for raising the um, data issue. Um, data is, of course, very important um, in the context of a potential uh, recommendation that could be considered a form of policy, like a governance type of uh, policy. I think it's really important um, to have conversations with attorneys, particularly attorneys that um, represent the district and or the city to understand um, the alignment of facts with certifications of a class and then alignment with the facts that this is what the harm report's purpose is. So I, I think that's really good. So that the harm report, 
I strongly suggest, and it sounds like you have had already some process. So we just, you know, as a board haven't seen it yet. So we'll have further questions or suggestions then. Um, the alignment of the data of the harm report to the suggested potential remedies. Um, these remedies are going to have um, a legal, a strong legal component to them. And I'm um, in order, honestly, for any remedy, uh, even if it's inside of a policy, to be successful, um, especially a remedy that's tied to an alleged harm from a specific actor, which in, in this case could be BUSD and or the entities around it. And I appreciate that conversation that's been opened about potential private entities in the city of Berkeley who might have benefited from uh, segregation and exclusion uh, and the impacts upon students in this district. Um, that that alignment is absolutely critical in order for that remedy to be successfully implemented, whether that be cash reparations or otherwise. Um, because this is uh, an area where there is a lot of data of disparity, I think it's important in that harm report to have attorneys who know what they're doing to understand which of those pieces of facts would be supportable in case we are sued, but also from a governance perspective to show the public that we've done all of our homework and this was not something that was pushed through without full vetting. Some of it they will not hear in closed session. Um, that's just the nature of some of it. But to have full public accounting through a harm report that is vetted by relevant reparations trained attorneys, I would assume, you know, or class action attorneys and hopefully reparations attorneys who know how to um, disaggregate that very complex data you're going to, that harm, that task force is going to be reviewing or the folks who are um, contracted to or otherwise to pull that data. Thank you. Vice President Brown, do you want to state your, do you have any legal analysis requests? And then we sure, um, I've already shared at this evening, but I'll share again that um, the legal analysis has already taken place. Um, the district adopted reparations task force has already um, shared that information with us and I look forward to receiving the report and I'm actually quite okay with that illegal that legal analysis that has already taken place and I do not want to overextend the district to ask for another one or make another financial um, impact on the district to ask for another legal analysis and so that's my direction. Well thanks I mean uh, I know you referenced the uh, limited legal analysis has been done. I'd love to see it, I haven't seen it yet. And I think for me, a closed session discussion on the legal analysis, but really looking at the potential liability of the harm report as Director Shinovsky stated, and also the different remedies recommended by the committee. And I think that feedback has been consistent. I've given it to the committee members myself. And so really appreciated the committee members reaching out to the board individually in June, sat down with them. And I know that we have legal expertise on that committee, but I think getting independent legal review and making sure that we're able to ask counsel that um, those kind of that back and forth dialogue, I think to understand is important, particularly because we see a lot of municipalities starting a lot of reparations related work and then pulling back when they look at the liability, right? And I don't, I definitely don't want to do that to our community. And as I, as I have stated publicly many times, I am so appreciative and very respectful of the work that's gone into this. And so when we commit to moving work forward, I want to make sure that I feel confident understanding the legal implications of that work. Thank you. If I may share, thank you, um, Vice Pre or President Vasudev, uh, for that. And um, it, just so that we can learn from uh, those entities, those government entities that had to pull back, can you share with us some of the uh, where who the entities are, um, so that you know we can learn from them why they why they pulled back? Yeah, you know I'm not privy to all of their closed session discussions, but you know like San Francisco had a task force that was really active, and then they rolled back um, their ability to move forward, and so I want to understand at the municipal level, right? And we're the first school district, so we don't have another district to point to in this situation. And we're really at the forefront, and I'm proud of us as a district for being at the forefront of ethnic studies. I said it yesterday to our babies, <laughs> and, you know, and, I'll, and I say it publicly all the time, when it comes to handling you know, dis discussions that are sometimes controversial, I'm very proud of the work that we do in Berkeley at being at the forefront but also understand, right, that when we approach this work that we have to make sure that we cross our T's and dot all our I's. And so if municipalities have rolled back some of their plans to move forward, I want to understand 
why, right? San Francisco is an example of one. There are others, right? I know that Evanston Director Ching uh, mentioned it, I think, at one of our public board meetings. Um, so I just want to have that understanding. And I think to feel comfortable, I really would love a closed session discussion to go back and forth with council so that I feel sure moving forward. Thank you. Hear, hearing these concerns, I'm just wondering why we didn't agendize that in our closed session before we came out to this meeting. I mean, if that's what you needed to move forward, then that's what agenda planning is really about. So we just need to be really thoughtful about agenda planning as well. I, I will answer that question and then I can have you answer superintendent, but I did express that in my one-on-one -on -one to the superintendent. I know that um, it sounds like she had talked to other board members about bringing it forward and that's fine. So we can publicly discuss with each other, but those concerns were brought up in my private conversations with the superintendent. If I could res respond just to a couple of things that I just heard. So, so one, I wanna say again, that the reason why it's coming today now is because again, the task force asked you all to ask me to explore um, and to come back in the fall. And you know, it, it might feel early to you all in terms of it being the fall, um, but again, the harm report is the first incident, sorry, is the first thing that we're going to move on. Again, takes time in terms of the RFP, in terms of the, the process of it, et cetera. Um, and so I thought coming to you all in October, which might feel like early fall to you, makes sense. But we also have to look at data at the next meeting and budget the next meeting after that. And so really, um, me bringing this forward today was really because, again, we made a commitment to the, to the task force. And honestly, as I think about all the things that are to be discussed, I did not want, to your point, Director Shinovsky, for to get lost in the fray. Um, I will also say to you that, again, the reason why I agendize this as a discussion is because I did want the board and the public to know, the task force maybe first and foremost to know that we didn't let it go, but also to publicly give you all these updates. We are and we have had a legal analysis that will be shared with you. And I did, I apologize if I went to buy that one too quickly, but what I said is that we would share it with you all the way that we share every other thing that has attorney client privilege, which is not an open session, which is in closed session. So I definitely plan on making sure there's time for you all to understand the implications and to get the answers to your questions provided in closed session. That said, I also wanna distinguish and clarify that I hear you all talking about um, a legal analysis just on the recommendations by themselves. And, and again, that has been done and can, can be done more if that is the direction of the board. Um, but the reason why I said ongoing is because we know that once we get the harm report uh, or once we decide to move and implement anything, we're gonna also need to have some legal um, advice and feedback around, again, um, you know, how we move and what we do, et cetera. So, so that it is true that there has been legal analysis. And again, we'll be bringing that to you, but legal analysis or, or legal feedback and input for us to be responsible will happen throughout the process as we think about not just the, the initial report itself, but also as we move forward towards implementation. Uh, again, I, I called out the harm report for the reasons I've said over and over in this presentation, but there is to me a sense of timeliness, which is also why I brought it for this October meeting and wanted to bring you something back uh, in the following meeting. And, and what that something back is, or what it could be, um, is um, a proposal. I've, I've now shared with you the estimated costs. I've also shared with you that we applied for a grant. Unfortunately, I don't know when we will know if we were awarded that matching grant. I do, um, like you, want to make sure that we are, um, you know, responsible stewards of our dollars while also responding to the ways that we have possibly caused harm to the descendants of slaves. And so, again, that that matching grant is was the was the um, an invite as as vice president. Brown said, but also just looking for uh, those dollars was suggested by the task force. So I think, again, I want to give them credit for, for making sure that we can move forward with this very important work, but also be responsible stewards of our dollars. Um, and so what I want to bring back to you in October is not just the proposal, one of which is, is 50000 we get match funds. Um, but also how we can proceed with that remaining $25. But also I think the RFP or a draft RFP would be helpful for you all because again, the RFP would be the way to kind of outline or at least pr provide some type of framework or structure of what would be expected in the harm report because that is what the, the organizations who bid to do the harm report will be responding to. So in some ways, the RFP would give a lot more information about what is in there and might actually be able to give you all some calm as you compare that to what the legal feedback is to be able to say that you are ready and comfortable moving forward. Thank you. I, um, sorry, may I go? Yeah. 
Thank you. I um, really appreciate uh, that recommendation. And uh, it's just a little another point of direction. As we uh, prepare for our closed session um, to talk about the harm analysis, I would like to give the direction to keep it specific to the harm report, especially because that is what we will uh, be voting or making a decision on on October 30th. And so, as you mentioned, there are going to be a lot of other um, opportunities to engage with the other parts of the recommendation, meaning the curricula and the payments. Um, but if we could uh, make sure that we are taking it step by step by step and dealing with these um, as packages within a larger package, um, I think that helping the board to really focus in on one area, which is the harm report, would be in our best interest. And so uh, as we look towards um, our and look towards receiving the aforementioned information, I think that we should just be specific um, as we prepare for, all additionally prepare for the vote for the harm report and the RFP process. And I support you bringing it back on the 30th and look forward to that presentation and uh, look forward to the vote on that. Thank you. So my guidance is still that I would prefer the closed session discussion before we bring it to a vote. Um, and so, and we do have a couple of agenda items already on the 30th for closed session that are also going to take up a lot of time. Um, so I'll work with the superintendent on that, but that's my recommendation that before we bring it to the vote that we have ample time for that closed session discussion. Well, I just wanna finally just um, acknowledge all of the community members who have been writing letters of support and uh, really asking us to, to really stick to our word that we would uh, take this up in the fall, and I just want to thank all of them for their um, support and encouragement for us to uh, really represent their interest in this matter. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Superintendent, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Great. And now, colleagues, we move to our action item, agenda item 15.1. Approval of resolution 25.010, issuing local assignment notification. And Superintendent, who's introducing this item? Samantha? Um, wherever you feel comfortable. All right. Um, so this is um, what is a local control um, uh, option for credentialing teachers. Um, and so speech and language pathologists are um, not the easiest to find. Um, fully credentialed um, speech and language pathologists are, are hard to find. Uh, this year, we were able to find somebody who has uh, their license from the state of California and has a master's degree, um, but does not have their credential. And so we are um, asking the board for approval to allow us to use what's called the local assignment option which will allow us to consider them highly qualified or credentialed or whatever um, so that they can do their job as our speech and language pathologist. And so we do not have to find a contractor to fill in um, instead of this person. Great, directors, do we have any questions before we approve this resolution? Um, Director Shinovsky and then Vice President Brown, do you have a question? Okay, let's start with Director Shinovsky. Just quickly, so just to be clear, this person would be uh, um, in the BFT unit with all the rights and privileges of a full-time credentialed employee, just with a sort of substitute credential. Yes, it's the same as anybody who gets a, like an emergency credential. Great, thank you. Um, not a question, just um, a point of appreciation. Uh, we know that we are in the... <sighs> day and age of shortages um, in education and that there are so many wonderful, powerful, uh, impactful educators who are impacted by our credentialing process. And so I wanna appreciate that we are uh, taking this step to uh, make sure that we are not uh, contracting out these types of uh, positions, but really doing everything in our power to help empower people and keep them uh, in our school district. So I'd I really appreciate this um, and I'm happy to move this one whenever, direct whenever President Basudez coughs for the motion. Great, if there are no further questions, I'm ready to call for the motion. Colleagues, can I get a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. So, go ahead, Khadija. So moved. Moved by Vice President Brown. I'll second seconded. Seconded by Director Shinovsky. All directors in favor? Yes. Aye. 
Um, I mean, those abstentions are, Ms. Charles, do you have to call the roll for this vote? No. All right. Well, great. Then the motion passes. Thank you, colleagues. And now we'll have, um, I know we still have to go recess to one more uh, closed session item, but before we do that, we also have a second opportunity for public comments. So, Ms. Charles, is there anyone online? Anyone online for public? I see. Yeah. Okay. Anyone in person for public comment? All right, so we move to our online public comment. We'll give that person two minutes, Christina's iPhone. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for allowing me to speak tonight. I hope you're doing well. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the superintendent for her email um, that she sent out. I believe it was on Monday. It was uh, very kind and very caring. Um, I do want to point out um, something that has been bothering me, which is that um, the the word Palestine has not really been used in a lot of the email communication. Um, I noticed that the sentence says, you know, people with ties to Israel and Gaza um, and language matters. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most of the people in Gaza are actually refugees from the Nekba in 1948. They're from other parts of Palestine. And so when we just kind of limit it to the word Gaza, we're kind of contributing to the ethnic cleansing and we're contributing to the erasure of Palestine. And so again, we do have Palestinian students in Berkeley. Um, we also have Lebanese students in Berkeley who are really hurting right now uh, with the violence that's escalated in Lebanon. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out as a language thing. So I would ask you and urge you to uh, have district communication, try to use that word. Um, Earlier, I heard the word intifada being used as like, as if it was a slur or as if it was some sort of hate speech. So I just want to clarify the meaning of the word. It's Arabic and it means uprising or shaking off. And it generally refers to the shaking off of systems of oppression. And so it was being used earlier as, I don't know, being demonized as something evil. And so I just wanted to clarify what that means. Um, and really proud of all the kids that went out and protested and used their freedom of speech. So thank you all for supporting that. And Director Brown for your comments earlier today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna thank everyone that came out this meeting. I'm not gonna close the meeting since we have to go back to a closed session discussion. So now the board will recess to our last closed session item for discussion. Thank you.